Aging and disease are biochemical processes that happen over many decades. So if we track and optimize well-established biomarkers of organ and systemic health, can aging and disease risk be slowed? That's the central premise of this channel. So with that in mind, earlier this month, I blood tested for the first time in 2023. And for those who are new to the channel, this is blood test number 42 since 2015. So with that in mind, what's my biological age? So we can see that data here. This is using Dr. Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator as an index of biological age. And if you're interested in measuring your own biological age using PhenoAge, that link will be in the video's description. So when entering its nine component biomarkers and chronological age, we can see that my biological age is 33 years old, which is 17 years younger than my chronological. Now note that for the eighth consecutive test, Quest's high sensitivity C-reactive protein measurement was less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. So CRP could be lower than 0.3 milligrams per liter, but not higher than 0.3 milligrams per liter. And rather than looking at just uh, data that I've entered into a spreadsheet, all blood test data will be included and we'll go through it later in the video. Now, this is just one test. For more context, let's have a look at biological age results since 2018. And I have data for 22 blood tests since that time. And that's what we can see here. So we've got Levine's biological age on the y-axis plotted against time starting from 2018 on the left all the way up to through this most recent test. So from 2018 to 2019, I have data for three tests. My average biological age using Levine's test was 36.1 years. And then from 2020 to 2021, over 12 tests, my average biological age was 35.6 years. And then over seven tests in 2022, I significantly reduced the, the, the value from 35.6 to 33.8 years. And if you missed that video, it'll be in the uh, right corner. So for 2023, we can see that with my 33 year measurement, that's off to a good start as it's lower than my average value for 2022. Now, this isn't the only biological age metric that I use. I also use aging.ai. So what's my aging.ai age? And we're, we can see that here when entering the 19 co component biomarkers that are found on aging.ai 3.0, I get a predicted age of 20, 28 years, which is 22 years younger than my chronological age. So just like we did for Levine's test, this is just one, da one data point, one test. So for more context, let's have a look at previous data for aging.ai age. And that's what we can see here. On the y-axis, we've got aging.ai age uh, plotted against time starting from 2009 up through uh, 2023. That should, should say 2023 there, not 2022. So I have 38 blood tests over that period. So in my earliest data from 2009 to 2013, I had three tests over five years and my average aging.ai age over that time was 32 years. And then in 2016, I just started, decided to test more often. So over the time period from 2016 to 2022, over that seven year period, I blood tested 34 times with an average aging.ai age of 29.9 years. And then with this test of 28, 28 years old, we can see that both PhenoAge and Aging.ai, these blood biomarker-based biological age metrics are off to a good start in 2023. So at this point in the video, I usually ask what may be contributing to these biological age reductions, including diet and or supplements. And I do in intend on including that data in a future video, but not the next video, two weeks from today. So uh, February 19th of 2023. So why? Why not go through it next week? So in order to address that, let's dig into the full blood test report as there's some interesting data at uh, towards the end. So here is the first uh, page of the screenshot from Quest lab report. And, I, and I'd, I'd like to highlight a few things. First is homocysteine at 10.8 micromolar. Now, if you saw the earlier video, I had a hypo hypothesis that glycine supplementation may reduce homocysteine. So I started glycine supplementation on December 15th at, at least two grams per day. There were a couple days that I had four grams per day. So I had at least 39 days of two grams per day of glycine prior to this test. But we can see that it didn't impact homocysteine at all as homocysteine went from 10 up, up to 10.8 micromolar. So I'm gonna have to come up with a different way to reduce homocysteine. So stay tuned for that. Now, moving forward, Quest flagged a couple of things in my blood test data, including the albumin to globulin, globulin ratio, which at 2.6 uh, by their range is high. So let's dissect the albumin to globulin ratio. First, my albumin for this test was 4.9. And uh, I have a video on this 
what's optimal in terms of health and potentially longevity for albumin is albumin in the 4.6 to 4.8 range. Uh, and that video will be in the right corner. So if you're interested in that, check it out. So I'm just outside that range, so not worried about it. What about globulin at 1.9? So that brings us to the question, what's optimal for globulin? Now, I haven't come across in how globulin changes during aging. Most likely it increases, but there is all-cause mort mortality data, albeit not much. In this study, we're looking at uh, the association for globulin with all-cause mortality risk or ACM risk, and this is in a study of more than 12,000 people. So in this study, 2.8 to 3.0 for globulin was identified as the reference, and then we can see that only higher, relatively higher levels of globulin, higher than 3.3, uh, were, was associated with a significant, significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. You can see that the hazard ratio is 1.47, which means a 47% increased risk for all-cause mortality when compared with globulin levels that were 2.8 to 3.0. And we can see that that's significant because the data in parentheses are both higher than 1. Conversely, for globulin levels that were less than the reference, 1.7 to 2.7, which is where my data for this test would fall, as my globulin level was 1.9, Although the hazard ratio was 1.19, we can see that the data in parentheses overlaps with one, so, th so that's not a significant association. So globulin less than 2.8 in this case was not significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So with that in mind, I'm not worried about globulin being a bit lower uh, than I've had on previ previous tests. Now, what also comes up as flagged as outside the range on Quest, uh, Quest data is alkaline phosphatase at 34. So what's optimal for alkaline phosphatase? So again, let's look at all-cause mortality data. That's what we can see here. ALP is alkaline phosphatase, and that's we're looking at the association for alkaline phosphatase with all-cause mortality risk. And this is in a study of more than 8.9 million people. So for what's significant, we go to a hazard ratio of 1, and then when the uh, dashed black lines are completely above 1, we have statist or below 1, we have statistically a statistically significant association. And that's only true once we get to an ALP of 48 units per liter. So above 48 for alkaline phosphatase, we can see a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. But that's not true for values less than uh, 48 for alkaline phosphatase, as you can see that the dashed black lines overlap with one. So correspondingly, I'm not worried about having an alkaline phosphatase of 34 on this test. This may be an aberrant value. My, my alkaline phosphatase is a bit higher generally, somewhere around 40, but not higher than 48, uh, fortunately. And then last on the blood test list that I want to highlight is DHEA sulfate. Based on Quest's reference range that you can see there, 61 to 442 micrograms per deciliter, it's not flagged as low. But if, you, if you've watched many videos on DHEA sulfate on my channel, it is indeed low, and it's not indicative of youth, but instead this is what you would expect to see from someone of my chronological age. So how will I optimize DHEA sulfate? Now, cholesterol conversion into DHEA, the precursor metabolite for DHEA sulfate, you're just adding a sulfate group onto DHEA, requires NADPH. So let's take a look at that. So that's what we can see here. So starting with cholesterol, cholesterol is converted into DHEA by five enzymatic steps, and each of them require NADPH, which then raises the question, what is NADPH? So NADPH stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and for those that are interested in longevity and familiar with the longevity space, that should seem really familiar because that's NAD. So NADPH is NAD, but with a phosphate group. So NAD phosphate is NADPH, which then raises the hypothesis, is relatively low NAD limiting the conversion of cholesterol into DHEA in my case, thereby limiting having a DHEA sulfate because if DHEA is low, I would also expect that DHEA sulfate is low. So to address this hypothesis, is relatively low uh, NAD limiting DHEA sulfate, I need to know what my NAD level is. And stay tuned for that data, as that will be the next video. That's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be, int may be interested in, including discount links for green tea, epigenetic testing, uh, testing your oral microbiome, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in that, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.